On today's show, the Dallas Mavericks are reportedly still looking for a power forward, somebody to play at the four to help the team. Who is that and which one fits the best? We'll talk about all the options on today's Locked On Mavs. I'm Luka Doncic and this is Locked On Mavericks. Welcome to the Mavericks. NBA champions. He is the It's good. And the Mavericks have won the game. If you don't believe, you shouldn't be here. Loyalty never fades away. Welcome, you are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Engstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for being part of the show and making Locked On Mavs your first listen today. But the best way you can help us grow the show is to listen every day, leave a five-star review on the podcast platform of your choice, like the video and comment anything below. Let me know in the comment section, which one player do you want the Mavericks to trade for? Which power forward, which four option? Let me know. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest, most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use that code lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Today's show, we'll talk about some trades. I'm talking about some trades the Mavs could do. At least some trade options, because I think there's options out there. But which one fits the best for the Mavericks? Could be a little bit difficult to figure out the power forward. Backup center. There's kind of. There's kind of like an issue with backup center in the NBA right now. And I got it. I got this idea from looking at all of our lockdown NBA hosts are filling out this trade deadline sheet. And I had them all fill it out and I had them put like needs and what they want. And I, there's more than one team, like three or four or five teams that need a backup center. Is there a problem? To, are the Mavericks not alone in this issue? And can they solve theirs? We'll talk about that. But let's start here. The Pascal Siakam rumors are not done. Apparently they're not over yet. Because there's rumors that he wouldn't re-sign in Sacramento, and that's why they have pulled out. Pascal Siakam is a two-time All-NBA power forward, four that plays, you know, 6'9", 6'10", can handle the ball a little bit, can definitely score the basketball, can play defense a, a good amount, has won a title with the, with the Raptors, and has been rumored that the Mavericks have rumored to be interested in him and interested in trading for him. And so... This is the big piece. This is the big player that's out there right now available on the trade deadline. The Mavericks seem to be interested. They've they've called. They've made calls to the, the Raptors and tried to figure out his availability and all that. There are reports and rumors from a bunch of different people. And so now it seems like the field is dwindling because Pascal Siakam has this weird thing in his salary and with his contract and with the, you know, with the Raptors. It's not weird for an NBA player, but it's weird for like, you know, a sports like kind of trade in general where if he goes somewhere, that team needs to know that he's going to resign because they're going to give up stuff. They're going to give up real stuff for him. If the Mavericks want to get Pascal Siakam, they're going to have to give up stuff that you and I are going to look like, look at and go, dang, I wish they didn't have to trade blank. Same thing that happened with the Kyrie trade. Dang, I wish they didn't have to trade Dorian. Wish they didn't have to trade the first round pick, right? With Pascal, Pascal Siakam, if that happens, they're going to have to give up something as well. He's making $37 million, so they're going to have to put some salaries in there and figure it out in some way. But is he the best option for the Mavericks? I've been on this the whole time. He would make the Mavericks better. But is he the perfect best fit for the Mavericks? He doesn't shoot the ball that well. He wants the ball in his hands. He wants to be a scorer. He wants to be, you know, one of the like one of the best players on the team. He wants he wants that. In his career and have players like that wanted that in the past and then gone to a situation where you go, man, I'm getting spoon fed some shots from Luca here. Yes. But also didn't Porzingis come into Dallas and it was just him and Luca. It wasn't him, Luca and Kyrie. It was just him and Luca at the time. And that still didn't work for Porzingis. Right. He admitted it recently. He wasn't mature enough to look at the situation and go, all right, I'm the number two and let's roll with it. Eventually he got there. I think. But then he wasn't, he, you know, it just didn't work. It didn't work out in the end for injury reasons, for the areas of Porzingis' game he needed to work out. He had to, he admitted he had to be humbled, basically. And going to Washington will do, we'll do that to you. But Pascal Siakam, if he's still an option, the Mavericks also have to make this decision that other teams would have to, to make. If they want to get Pascal Siakam, if they want to take this step forward, that would be a big step forward, I think, the team would definitely get better. Because then all of a sudden you got three guys that you can put out there and a game like the Knicks game that's coming up when Luka is out and Kyrie's playing, at least Kyrie has Pascal Siakam, right? It would hurt the Mavericks when it comes to flexibility. 
with their cap. It would hurt them flexibility with a couple of things. But the Mavs have to make the decision if they are going to re-sign him too. Our friend CBA Mavs on Twitter posted the salary that or the, the contract that Pascal Siakam could get, the five-year max he could get if he came to the Mavericks in a trade in the middle of the season. The Mavs got his bird rights, and they re-signed him to the max. Here we go. You ready? First year, 24-25 season, $42.8 million. Next year, $46 million. The year after that, $49 million. $53 million the year after that. And then the 2028-29 season, $56.5 million. And that's past when Luka is going to is signed through. It's obviously past when Kyrie is going to be signed through. 28-29 is if you go to Spotrack, which is what I use to look at salaries and uh, <laughs> and like cap sheets. Spotrack doesn't even show the 2028-29 season. They only show five years in advance this season and then four more. So his salary would be off the charts, literally off the charts. So would, would Pascal Siakam be the right player for the Mavericks? If you can get him, sometimes you got to look at a deal. And I think Nico Harrison definitely weighs things like this. Sometimes you just got to look at, all right, we don't know if something else is going to be available. All of a sudden, if all these teams start falling off and they're like, Man, Sacramento's obviously all of a sudden not interested. Indiana came out, and there's a rumor that they're not interested in putting Jairus Walker in a deal. He was their first-round pick this season. If the Mavericks say, all right, well, we'll put Omax in this deal, and we'll put Hardy, and we'll put a first if you want it, and we'll put, you know, Josh Green or, or Grant Williams or some of our younger pieces, like you want a couple of those, and all of a sudden, like, the Mavs are like, we're not really giving up that much to get a two-time All-NBA type guy. That could definitely help us. Nico Harrison has to weigh that and decide if that's what they want to go into. And if the Mavs do have enough, if they're willing to give up enough for what the Raptors want, that's, that's, that's what you got to figure out. Do you trust Nico Harrison to make that decision? I think I do at this point after last off season, I look at the deals that he made and even the Kyrie trade. I look at it and go, all right, in Nico, we trust I'm, I'm for it. I'm like, I'm with you on this. Let's go for it. What I would do in this situation, I don't think I would. I don't think I would trade for Pascal Siakam because I do think it's going to have to be too much. Because you're going to look at it and go, "All right, if they have to give up the first and and some of the young players and some, you know, maybe some role, young role players that would fill out the roster." Now all of a sudden, okay, it's Luca, Kyrie, and Pascal Siakam, and what and Derek Lively. And whatever else you got, and you got to win a title. Because look at what look at what's happening to the Phoenix Suns right now. This is a tough thing to be in. If you've got f- three max players, Devin Booker's making thirty six million dollars this season, so it's pretty close to the Luca, Kyrie, Pascal Siakam what they're making this season. Next year for them, it's going to bump up to all three of those guys making fifty million. <laughs> and look at where they are right now. They've got Nurkic, they've got Grayson Allen, they've got Nas Little, they've got Eric Gordon, they've got Josh Okogie. And then everything else you're looking at going, oh my God, <laughs> what, are, what are we doing? It's tough to have three max guys and they have to be championship level. It's got to be the, you know, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown. Sporting is making a max still. I think an old max, I think he's still on. It's got to work and it's got to be right. Do I think Luca can win a title with Kyrie and Pascal? Actually, I think I do. Maybe that's enough. Maybe that should be enough for me to look at it. Yeah, they've got they've got Tatum, Brown, Porzingis, and Holiday all making like thirty one to thirty six million dollars. So they're kind of they're playing they're playing with how they're playing with real old rules like two thousand. They're playing with like two thousand eighteen cap money <laughs> with these with these deals. But should the Mavericks do a Pascal Siakam deal? I think it depends on the price, which is the question. the The question that Nico Harrison's got to ask. And if you think that he is the perfect fit for it, then I think you pull the trigger and you do it. But I don't think I would right now because I don't think he is the perfect fit. I don't think he's going to want to come here and be the third banana, the third fiddle, the third, I don't know, the third chair, <laughs> you know, the third rock from the sun. Like, I don't know. I don't think he's going to want to be that guy and just stand in the corner. And then if he, if he comes here and all of a sudden he doesn't like it, then all of a sudden did you make a big risk by sending out some stuff and then he doesn't re-sign because he's not a restricted free agent. He's an unrestricted free agent. A tough decision Nico Harrison has to make with Pascal Siakam. I don't think he's the exact perfect right fit because of price, because of uh, play style, and because of what he wants in 
his career. But coming up, let's talk about other power forwards and other fours that the Mavericks could trade for. Jeremy Grant, Kyle Kuzma, Isaiah Stewart, all have been mentioned in the past. Let's talk about them and more coming up. Today's episode brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. All you have to do is go to Prize Picks, and you're not playing against pros or sharks, and you're not battling against thousands of other players as well. You pick more or less than the two to six player stat projections that you have. So pick pick a couple players, pick a stat projection that they have on there, and you pick more or less. They've got a couple for the Mavericks game against the Knicks coming up. They have, um, let's look at, oh, where did he go? Let's go, they got Kyrie Irving. They've got Kyrie already on here with 30 and a half points. So you pick more or less with him against the Knicks. Give me more. I'm, I'm going to believe in Kyrie in this one. They've got our old friend uh, Jalen Brunson. No, I don't have him up anymore. They've got a couple others you can pick. Just pick more or less. Let's go Devin Booker against the Lakers. Let's go less with Devin Booker. Just I didn't even tell you the number. It doesn't even matter. LeBron James, 26 and a half. I'll go less just for Isaac. And his hatred of LeBron James. Tw- put down 20 bucks on those three. If they all hit, then you get 100 bucks in that. So, again, go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. If you put down 100 bucks into your account, they'll match it with 100 bucks. Prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use that code locked on NBA. Shut it down. Oh, Let's go. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us on Locked On Maps, being part of the show, part of the Raccoon Squad, listening every day. We appreciate each and every one of you for listening. Go check out the Locked On Sports Dallas YouTube channel. They've got a 24-7 stream of a bunch of different shows that we put together and curated for you to watch. If you just you know want to, if you like to throw up this show on, in the corner while you're doing something else, throw up this show. Throw up Locked On Sports Dallas on YouTube or on Firestick TV. Check it out. Locked On Sports Dallas on YouTube, Firestick TV. All right, let's get into some more power forwards. We talked about Pascal Siakam. He's still the number one on the list. If he's if he's available, you've got to ask the question and you've got to look into it. Jeremy Grant, he plays for the Portland Trailblazers. The Mavs have played him four times. <laughs> I've played his team four times this year already. And I think we've gotten a good idea of who Jeremy Grant is. I had Mike Richmond of Lockdown Blazers on here to talk about him and to talk about what he could be. And the way Mike Richmond talked about him, I was so out. <laughs> because he's seen him and he's watched him every game since he's come to the Blazers. And listening to, listening to him talk about Jeremy Grant, well, he's not that great of a defender, but he hasn't really tried recently because of the Blazers. The Blazers haven't been winning that much, so maybe he can get back to it. And then also, he doesn't fully like create his own shot, but he can hit the three. He's shot really well from three. Okay, the Mavs would add a three-point shooter that can't really do a whole a ton else. Isn't going to add a whole lot to your team, but you're paying him $27 million this year, $29 million the year after that, $32 after that, $34 the year after that, and $36 million on a player option. Oof. The price tag is too steep for me. The price tag for his contract because you start to get you start to have some issues there, and then this is wild. But <laughs> you start to have some issues because all of a sudden, like Jeremy Grant's still going to be on your your cap sheet, and it's kind of hard to think this way. He's going to be on your cap sheet when like Derek Lively's a restricted free agent. <laughs> in one in, after this year, it's three more years he's got on the rookie deal, and then he'll be a restricted free agent. You've got to re-sign him. You shouldn't really think that long when you've got Luka and Kyrie right now. But but just to put it into perspective, the Mavericks would have to, you'd have to live with that decision for a long time. And I just don't think he's that type of player, one, that fixes any of the Mavericks needs. If he's just going to bring three-point shooting, a little bit of maybe on-ball creation, you know, just a little shot making here and there, I don't think that's enough for the Mavericks. It's not fixing any of the issues. Kyle Kuzma. Making $25 million this year, so just about the same as Jeremy Grant, but then it goes 23, 21, and 19 million. That's much easier for me. If I'm gonna decide on like a shot making four that the Mavericks want to bring in, that's one I can understand a lot more is Kyle Kuzma. If the Wizards decide to move on from Kyle Kuzma, I think he's one that the Maverick that I would be interested in. I don't think I would give up a first round pick for him because of <laughs> Always sending Philadelphia because of the implication. The implication is that then you don't have like three first round picks in the off season to to work with. But Kyle Kuzma's six nine. He would be one of the, he would be the Mavericks' biggest wing by far, and and honestly bigger than some of their centers. The thing is with Kyle Kuzma though, he hasn't really shot the ball that well this year. He's shooting just under thirty five percent from three, which is still like thirty six percent is league average. So he's not shooting that well from three on. Eight threes a game that he takes. You do like the volume that he'll take that many threes. But like the rest of his career, his best season was 36% 
and that was with the Lakers, his rookie year and his uh, fourth year. So like he's he's kind of like a league average or just under league average shooter. But with Luca, would that kick up a little bit? Possibly. It's helped with Derek Jones Jr. for sure. He can make some shots though, and he can make some some tough shots. He's he's playing with the Washington Wizards right now. He's got the he's probably got the number one defender on him every single night. <laughs> he's scoring twenty two points a game. Uh, you know, shooting the ball decently well. And he's played good defense in the past. That's, I think, the difference between that one. Another one of the differences between Kuzma and Jeremy Grant is that Kuzma has played playoff level defense. He played 23 minutes a game on the Lakers team that won the title in the bubble. And he was playing good defense on that team. So, you know, he's capable of it. So he's a little bit bigger. He doesn't shoot the ball as well, but he makes shots a little bit better. Like he can, he can get his own shot a little bit better than Jeremy Grant. And then we, he has the like the history of defending better. That's a that's a bet I think I would make a little bit more. Does he fix all the Mavericks' problems? No, not even close. The Mavs need an elite defender at that spot. They need somebody that can defend really, really well at that spot. That that's their calling card. That they go, I'm a defender first. And I defend the heck out of everybody, right? Like that is a stopper. One of the reasons why the Mavericks' defense keeps is so porous and keeps like getting destroyed in some of these games, like the game against the Grizzlies. They don't have just one guy that can throw on somebody and go, all right, lock them down. You handle your business. And then all of us can handle our business behind you. They don't have that guy. Derek Jones Jr. Has been great. He's had a lot. XM has been good. When you got those two guys together, it's a lot easier, but they don't have that guy when it's just him by himself. So Kyle Kuzma, Jeremy Grant, they kind of represent the next tier of, what about, what about this guy? <laughs> Can the Mavericks get this guy? I think they're both gettable. I think the Mavericks have what it would take to get those guys because they have a first-round pick, because they have some young guys. They've got the, the, you know, the contracts for it and contracts that would look better. I do think that the, the Blazers would look at Tim Hardaway Jr. and Rashawn Holmes and go, man, if we can get off this money two, like three years earlier, we feel pretty good about that. We feel pretty good about that. I think they would look at that and you throw in a couple seconds and they could get Jeremy Grant. So I don't think he would cost that much. Kyle Kuzma, probably a little bit more because he's the, the wizard's only tradable, like decent piece. I feel, I feel, I feel like Denny obvious. Sure. you know, they've got some, they've got some others. Well, cool. Bali is young, but they're not going to trade him. Boyan Bogdanovich is a name that we haven't, you and I haven't talked about a lot, but Boyan Bogdanovich for the Pistons, the Mavericks have been connected with him in the past. There was a report that the Mavericks were doing a trade for Boyan Bogdanovich, like that it was going through and it just didn't happen, which I think happens a lot more than we know. He's making 20 million this year. He's six, seven. He's not adding a ton of size to the Mavericks. He is adding shot making. He's also 34 years old. He'll be 35 in April. So what are you really trading for? He came back to the Pistons. He's still averaging 20 points a game, and he's shooting 40% from three on seven threes a game on the Pistons, which is, like, so impressive to me. <laughs> it's so impressive to me that he is. The Pistons can't shoot at all, and they bring in this guy, and he shoots 40% from three. He's getting the worst three-point looks and shooting really well. He would help the Mavs offense for sure. I kind of feel like he would help the Mavs offense more than Kyle Kuzma would, <laughs> which is weird to say. But I think he, I think he definitely would. The problem is, how long are you getting him for? The Mavs want to add a piece that can can grow with Luka, that can build. Like, Nico Harrison wants to continue his thing of, all right, we're going to keep trying to win now, but we're also going to try and win in the future with Derek Lively, with Omax, with bringing in Grant, who's younger, with trying to develop Jaden Hardy, you know, trying to do all that. So with Bogdanovich, that, you've got to weigh that one too. And so if you don't have to give up a lot, Boyan Bogdanovich would help you right now. He would definitely help this, this team this season. But then you've also you've got to also ask this other question. At a 34-year-old Bogdanovich and Luca and Kyrie, can you play all three of them together to defend in a playoff setting? Bogdanovich has been a solid defender in the past. But am I am I making that bet right now? His teammate, Isaiah Stewart, has also been connected to the Mavericks. Isaiah Stewart just got re- signed to an extension. So he's got the same kind of issues as Josh Green when it comes to trading those two. You've got to figure out if you've got to figure out if uh, you want to figure you, you want to deal with that. It's a po- poison pill. So like he is only making five million this year, but it's fifteen million each of the next four years after that. Isaiah Stewart six eight. He's big. He would have definitely helped against that against the Grizzlies front line because they are just big dudes, and so he would help in that area. But 
I mentioned what Kuka Hill, Locked On Pistons, told me about Isaiah Stewart is that he just doesn't bring a whole lot else. He's not an elite defender. He's not an elite rim protector. He can't really pass the ball that well. He's tried to add a three. He's actually shooting 40% from three this year on three and a half per game. So he's definitely he's definitely a, a, been a better shooter. I think playing with Luka could help for sure. So maybe he adds a little shooting, and he definitely adds some rebounding and size. Maybe that's all the Mavericks need. But at the four spot with him and Lively, is that too much shaky shooting? I'm not sure. And the price tag, paying $15 million each of the next four years after this one. And the poison pill. That's interesting. I can understand why they didn't do it. Quickly, some other names. Dorian Finney-Smith. His contract compared to some of these other ones looks, looks pretty good. $14 million, $14 million, and $15 million. Compared to Harrison Barnes is making 17, 18, and 19 million each of the next three years. So those two I think are available. The Kings have already shopped Harrison Barnes because they tried to, to put him into a Pascal Siakam deal. They want to upgrade that spot. Could he come in and help the Mavericks? Neither of those guys are helping with Mavericks and size. So that kind of stinks. But it would help them with depth. It would help them with some defense, definitely with Dorian bringing him back. Dorian makes a lot of sense, but are the Nets. Are the Nets going to try and like squeeze everything they can out of each of these trades to try and get more assets? I think they will. I think they would. Coming up, let's keep talking about these power forwards. I'm going to push the backup center thing to another day because I think we'll have more time with it. I want to spend more time with it, and I've got a couple other names I want to talk about. So coming up, let's get into more of these fours and who the Mavericks could trade for coming up. Today's episode brought to you by Jace Medical. Everybody has a situation in your life where you all of a sudden get nervous and you're like, oh my gosh, is an emergency happening? And then what happens? You go into a mode where you're like, all right, where are my supplies? Where are my backup this? Where did I put the water? You know, when we had the big freeze, everyone was like, all right, where did I put this? You need to know where you have your uh, antibiotics to help you with bacterial diseases, UTIs, respiratory infections, sinuses, skin infections. You never know what could happen. According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season. So Jace Medical has a pack of five different antibiotics. I've got it right here. Got my Jace case. They've got this pack of antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses like UTIs and all the stuff I mentioned earlier. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to Jace Medical, J-A-S-E Medical. Dot com and use the code locked on to get $20 off your first order. Again, that's jacemedical.com. All right, Isaac, let's get into some more of these names. Pushing the backup center conversation to a different day. I really want to spend some time on that. I think the NBA has an issue, so later date. And uh, I should have Jake Fisher on the show later today. Should be double dose of lockdown maps today. So I should have them on. So that should be great. Harrison Barnes and Dorian Finney Smith. Both of those guys, I think, would help the Mavericks for sure. Their price tag is definitely lower than the Kuzmas or the Jeremy Grants, I think. But I think the Nets will try to squeeze everything they can out of a Dorian Finney Smith trade. That one's gonna be that one's gonna be tough. Would love to have Doe back in in Dallas. He also doesn't fix the Mavericks size thing. The Mavs had a size issue even when Dorian was here. That's kind of an issue. John Collins is an interesting name to me. The Jazz are playing really well right now. And John Collins is already like, there's already been some weird rumors that he doesn't really like how he's being used in Utah. Now, if he came to Dallas, would he be used a lot better? I don't know. He's playing a decent amount. He's playing like 26 minutes a game or so, 25 minutes a game or so for them. He's getting a decent amount of shots. And... But I think he could be available. I don't know if I don't know if the Jazz are buyers or sellers, right? Like, look at the, look at what the Jazz are right now. They've beaten a bunch of good teams recently. It's just this is a wild team. I actually don't feel as bad about the Mavs loss to the Jazz as I did that that, that night because the Mavs or the Jazz recently have beaten. Uh, they beat the Mavericks. They beat the Heat. They beat the uh, Celt. They beat the Sixers, the Bucks, and then they just beat the Nuggets. They have. They're going on this incredible run right now where they're just beating up on teams. Could John Collins be available? Maybe. I think his price is probably a little higher than it was recently because the Jazz have been playing well. He's making he's making $25 million, then $26, then a $26 million player option. So around the same as what uh, Kuzma and Jeremy Grant are making. That's a lot. 
He also doesn't fix the Mavericks problems. Are you starting to see a trend here? <laughs> There's not really a player out there that fixes the Mavericks problems. There's not like a play. I don't, I can't even find a type of player that would be available. I'm going to say that there are players out there. There's an Aaron Gordon that exists. You know, there's guys like that out there that could help the Mavericks, but there's not one that comes in and fixes the Mavericks defense because there's not a lot of elite defensive fours. They're just not. They're either, they're a lot of role playing guys like the ones that I mentioned. Siakam's honestly one of the best ones. Julius Randle, another one. There's just not a lot of those guys out there. And so, I think we have to calibrate maybe our expectations on what one of these trades could do. But John Collins, I'm out on him as like a as a trade. It's just a lot of money. I don't think he would come in and help the Mavericks with what they need necessarily. He would add size. He would add rebounding. Again, maybe the Isaiah Stewart clause. Maybe that's all the Mavs need. <laughs> we just need a little bit more size, a little bit more rebounding. If they can add it, then it doesn't cost a whole lot, then sure. But I think it'll cost more than what would be a little in your mind or mine. Andrew Wiggins, another guy that's available. This one, this one is interesting. <laughs> Andrew Wiggins, I can't figure him out. And neither can the Warriors, his own team. He's making $24 million this year, 26 then 28 then $30 million on a player option. A bunch of money. About the same as what Collins is making. About the same as the Jeremy Grant, Kyle Kuzma tier of guys. His first three year, three full years in with the Warriors, he averaged... Like 17, 18 points a game. He made the all-star team in 2022, which is ridiculous, but still. He was arguably, you remember this, he was arguably their second best player in the playoff run. (laughs) He was really good in their playoff run. 16 and a half points a game, seven and a half rebounds, about two assists, a steal, a block. He was shooting decently. Like just killing it in the playoffs. And now he's just completely fallen off. And this year he's averaging like 12 points a game. He's shooting under 30% from three, which is not it's just terrible. And he has been benched. Like they cannot figure out what's going on with him. He also missed a ton of games last year for a reason that I don't think we know. I don't know what it is. Maybe you do. Let me know. I'm out on Andrew Wiggins. There's too many red, like all these red flags. I just said, maybe he could like, you have to make a bet. Maybe he comes to Dallas and maybe he breaks out of this slump and maybe he figures it out and maybe he decides to stay. Maybe some of these issues don't creep up again and maybe it all works together. But he's not fixing some of your issues either. He can create his own shot a little bit. He, he could shoot. He hasn't been able to this year. Six, seven, so he's got some size, but it's the same as like Dorian or Harrison Barnes or one of those. Mavs need one of those guys, but they, they need more size than that. Couple other names that I've mentioned before: Tory Craig. He's out with an injury right now. He's got some plantar fasciitis, I think. Same as what uh, it seems like Dante Exum is dealing with. He adds a little bit. He's a cheap. These are two cheaper options: Tory Craig and Jared Vanderbilt, who come in and help the Mavs a little bit. If they just want one more guy, if they just want to throw a second round pick and say, "Let's take on Tory Craig," and he's making minimum, so the Mavs wouldn't have to send a lot out. Say Marcus Morris in a second round pick, or Markeith Morris in a second round pick. And try and just try somebody else. Say, all right, Grant Williams isn't working as well as we thought. Let's try Tory Craig in those in, in that spot instead and see if that helps. Or just lights a fire under Grant's ass. <laughs> Jared Vanderbilt, another one. The problem with him, though, is just no offense. Not even looking to the rim at times for the Lakers. That's been tough for them. I would definitely be interested in Jared Vanderbilt for the Mavs. Just bring in somebody with some size. The Mavs can, I think they can figure it out. The difference between a Vanderbilt, um, a Jared Vanderbilt, and some of those other guys I mentioned before, like an Isaiah Stewart or, you know, one of those others, he doesn't cost as much, for sure. And he, you wouldn't, the expectation wouldn't be there for playing time. Although, Jared Vanderbilt does have, like, a poison pill as well with his because he's making four and a half million this year, then 10, then 11, then 12, then $13 million player option. It's actually pretty similar to Isaiah Stewart. Less money overall for sure. A lot less money overall. But still a similar situation where you've got to figure out, all right, does this guy work for us? Does, can we figure this out with him not hitting any threes really at all? Like he can't shoot at all. Isaiah Stewart can at least hit a three. But his defense is a lot more sound and a lot more disruptive and a lot more, uh, you could play him <laughs> definitely a lot more than Isaiah Stewart at times. That's what you have to weigh. Let me know in the comment section which of these players stands out to you the most. What am I, who am I wrong about? Who should the Mavericks trade for? Let me know in the comment section. And hopefully we'll be back with uh, 
Jake Fisher tomorrow on the show, as well as the, the post-game show about the Knicks. Big day, big day. We'll talk about all that and more tomorrow. Guys, thanks so much for listening to Lockdown Maps. Peace out. Boom. Boom.